The hearing will come to order. Dr. J.R. Oppenheimer, the Institute for Advanced Study, Princeton, New Jersey. In view of your access to highly sensitive classified information, and in view of allegations which, until disproved, raise questions as to your veracity, conduct, and even your loyalty, the Commission has no other recourse but to suspend your clearance until the matter has been resolved. In 1954, a hearing began in a makeshift courtroom in Washington, D.C. America's most eminent scientist was under interrogation accused of being a risk to national security. In the era of Senator Joe McCarthy, no one was above suspicion. It was reported that you stated that you were not a communist, but it probably belonged to every communist front organization on the West Coast, and had signed many petitions in which communists were interested. The news sent shockwaves through American society. If Robert Oppenheimer couldn't be trusted, no one could. Oppenheimer was proud, arrogant and brilliant. A polymath whose interests stretched from physics to poetry. He was a national hero who spent the last decade advising at the heart of American government. But most of America knew him for one thing leading the team which created the atomic bomb. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that, one way or another. Having created the bomb, Oppenheimer spent much of his subsequent career trying to warn his masters of its dangers. In doing so, he made some powerful enemies. The country asked him to do something, and he did it brilliantly. And they repaid him for the tremendous job he did by breaking him. Doctor, do you think that social contacts between a person employed in secret war work and communists or communist adherents is dangerous? Are we talking about today? Yes. Certainly not necessarily so. They could conceivably be. Was that your view in 1943 and during the war years? The hearing would last almost a month. It would pick over every detail of Oppenheimer's life, challenging his loyalty, questioning his judgment, and exposing his secrets. To make his defense, Oppenheimer decided to tell his own story. The items of so-called derogatory uh, information cannot be fairly understood except in the context of my life and, and work. I was born in New York in 1904. My father came to this country at the age of 17 uh, from Germany. Julius Oppenheimer was a Jewish immigrant who'd arrived in America in 1888 without any English or any money. He started work in an uncle's factory and by the age of 30 was a wealthy man. Oppenheimer's mother, Ella, was from Baltimore and had worked as an art teacher before her marriage. A friend remembered her as very delicate with an air of sadness. 
As a child, Robert was precociously brilliant and his parents were extremely protective. Often ill and generally frail, he was an introverted child. He had little contact with anyone his own age. He wasn't mischievous. He was too brilliant to be just one of the children. But his parents treasured him, treated him like a little jewel, and he just skipped being a boy. My childhood did not prepare me for the fact that the world is full of cruel and bitter things, Oppenheimer said. It gave me no normal, healthy way to be a bastard. Eight years separated Robert from his brother Frank, too many for friendship. He became a loner. When he started at the Ethical Cultural School in New York, he lived in his own world, more comfortable with teachers than fellow pupils. The other kids called him Booby Oppenheimer. Seeking reassurance in his own intelligence, he became increasingly arrogant and aloof. Oppenheimer excelled at school and secured a place at Harvard. He studied physics, chemistry, maths, English and French literature, Western, Chinese and Hindu philosophy. He even found time to write stories and poems. He described it as being like the Huns invading Rome, by which he meant he was going to swallow up every bit of culture and art and science that he could possibly do. Harvard's an environment in which the intellectual life is a rich feast, but the social life is a desert. The isolation eventually began to take its toll on Oppenheimer. His inability to connect with people or even find a girlfriend could, one friend remembered, lead him into bouts of melancholy and deep, deep depression. In the days of my almost infinitely prolonged adolescence, he later wrote, I hardly did anything that did not arouse in me a very great sense of revulsion. My feeling about myself was always one of extreme discontent. In 1925, after three years at Harvard, Oppenheimer started a graduate degree in the famous Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. An ambitious student who'd always had easy success academically, Oppenheimer expected to excel. But he was wrong. Oppenheimer, like so many theoretical physicists, it turns out that if he walks through a lab, the instruments all break. And he's trying to do a rather delicate physical experiment, and he's not getting anywhere. And he's sinking deeper and deeper into that special despair that comes along when prodigies grow up and, have, and realize they can't just do it by being a prodigy anymore. He fell into despair, he fell into depression. Here was a point where he was suddenly doubting his intellect, his ability to do science. So it's not surprising that at that point, the whole thing would go collapsing down for him. Almost overwhelmed with his recurrent depression, he was, he later said, at the point of bumping myself off. The next year, Oppenheimer deserted the experimental tradition of Cambridge and moved to the German University of Göttingen, a hotbed of theoretical physics, home to some of the greatest physicists of the time. I had great misgivings about myself on all fronts, he said. I hadn't been good, I hadn't done anybody any good, and here was something I felt driven to try. But his misgivings were misplaced. In Göttingen, Oppenheimer would find his chance to shine in the discipline which was revolutionizing science, quantum physics. Quantum physics is the basic physics behind electrons and atoms. It turns out that classical ideas about Newtonian mechanics and particle motion and so on do not apply to things of, to things of atomic scale. You needed a new kind of physics. So if you're going to change at a different scale the, the whole structure of the physics, everything has to be redone, if you will. And that means there are enormous opportunities available for a young graduate student with talent to come in and make various aspects of this his own. 
Oppenheimer was entranced by the strangeness of the quantum world, where certainty disappeared and probability ruled. He found his work exhilarating. There was terror, he wrote, as well as exultation. Oppenheimer really flourished there. He annoyed everybody, of course, by talking too much and <laughs> pretending he knew everything. He always considered very carefully what he said, as though he was uh, speaking for, for the ages. And he expected everybody to be seduced by his Renaissance man knowledge of everything. Having found his niche, Oppenheimer excelled in Göttingen, publishing 16 papers in three years. By the time he decided to return home, he had a newfound focus and confidence, as well as an international reputation. In the spring of 1929, I returned to the United States. I was homesick for this country. I had learned in my student days a great deal about the new physics. I wanted to pursue this myself, uh, to explain it, and to foster its cultivation. Though he was still only 25, Oppenheimer already knew more about quantum physics than any other American. He soon found teaching posts at Caltech and Berkeley. At first, though, he struggled to adjust to teaching. It was customary, until I got there, for students to take his main course in theoretical physics, twice in a row. They would take a second year to fully understand it. He spoke at a very fast clip, puffing on his cigarette, which he always had. He was writing with his chalk, and he was moving back and forth between his left hand and his right hand so quickly that people thought he was going to smoke the chalk, you know, and write with the cigarette. Uh, and they could not, couldn't follow him. But he was able to transform himself into an excellent lecturer who was charismatic and extremely effective. Though he managed to transform his teaching style, Oppenheimer still struggled with friendships. He was not likable because he wouldn't let you look at him. He was always on stage. There was always a studied remark uh, intended to convey some sort of, I don't know, superiority or deeper knowledge than you, you slob could possibly understand. He could be devastating, especially to young people. He became very impatient and was always all over them, and sometimes reduced them practically to tears. His sharp remarks were not inadvertent. They had to do with a kind of arrogance and contempt. I take it to be a way that he disguised his anxieties, that he disguised his social insecurities, but it was immensely cruel. Oppenheimer called his behavior beastliness. It is not easy, he wrote in a letter to his brother, at least it is not easy for me to be quite free of the desire to browbeat somebody. As the 1930s progressed and the US struggled through the Great Depression with massive unemployment and riots, Oppenheimer settled into a closeted academic life. He remained largely disconnected from the turbulence and remarkably unconcerned. I had no radio, no telephone. I never read a newspaper or a current magazine. I learned of the stock market crash in the fall of 1929, only long after the event. I voted for the first time in a presidential election in 1936. I was deeply interested in my science but I had no understanding of the relations of man to his society. The depression didn't affect him personally. He had an income from his father, who was wealthy, and politics seemed gross to him. Beginning late in 1936, my interests began to change. I saw what the depression was doing to my students. Often they could get no jobs but I had no framework of political conviction or experience to give me perspective in these matters. In the spring of 1936, I was introduced by friends to Jean Tatlock. In the autumn, I began to court her. 
We were at least twice close enough to marriage to think of ourselves as engaged. Tadlock was Oppenheimer's long-awaited first love. A 22-year-old medical student, she was a passionate activist for causes ranging from the Spanish Civil War to racial discrimination. She was also a member of the Communist Party and introduced Robert to the world of politics. I made left-wing friends and felt sympathy for causes which hitherto would have seemed so remote from me, like the Loyalist cause in Spain and the Organization of Migratory Workers. I liked the new sense of companionship and at the time felt that I was coming to be part of the life of my time and country. I did not then regard communists as dangerous and some of their declared objectives seemed to me desirable. In the 1930s, in the bottom of the Depression, there was a deep and fundamental concern about the future of this country, of whether its economic and to some degree political system was adequate. We came later in America to demonize people who belonged to the Communist Party, but it was a very common business in the 30s. Oppenheimer never joined the party. The FBI spent 30 years trying to prove that Oppenheimer had been a communist and was never able to do so. That's probably good evidence that he never joined the party. Oppenheimer became deeply attached to Jean, but the relationship was problematic. She was volatile and moody. After three years, she left him. Robert never lost his feelings for Jean, but he did eventually find another woman to love. Kitty Harrison was 29 and also a former member of the Communist Party. She was married when she met Robert, but pursued him relentlessly. When she saw Oppenheimer, she grabbed him. They were together, of course, for the rest of their lives, but it was, God knows, a tumultuous relationship with a lot of bickering and a lot of fighting and a lot of drinking. You know, Kitty and Jean were both dominant women. They were passionate women. And in some way, he could comfort them. He could save them or try to. Here were two women who both presented themselves as people who needed saving. And Robert jumped in like the, like the white knight that he, I think, wanted to be. In 1940, Oppenheimer became Kitty's fourth husband. Months later, their first child was born. As they started to build a family, the Oppenheimers started to distance themselves from Communist Party politics. My views were evolving. At that time, I did not fully understand, as in time I came to understand, uh, how completely the Communist Party in this country was under the control of Russia. Many of its declared objectives seemed desirable to me, but I never accepted communist dogma or theory. In fact, it never made any sense to me. But Oppenheimer had always been more interested in physics than politics, and his career was progressing. Of course, he paid attention to experiment, but he was a theorist. He probed very deeply he was interested in the deepest ideas, and he did contribute to some of them. In 1939, he published with his student, Hartland Schneider, really a great piece of work explaining how stars collapse, how they can actually end up as black holes, which had never been understood before. Not long after Oppenheimer's paper, a German journal published an article that would change the course of history and Oppenheimer's life. The article proved that splitting the atom was possible. The idea was soon named nuclear fission. The U business is unbelievable, wrote Oppenheimer. I think it really not too improbable that a 10 centimeter cube of uranium deuteride might very well blow itself to hell. He wasn't the only one to think so. The race for a nuclear bomb had begun. He saw already at the beginning, as I think any really good physicist did just by doing the numbers about the amount of energy released in this reaction, that this was going to change the world. With that discovery came a change in the relationship between science and the nation state. Every country in the world 
1939 and 1940 that had the capability of even beginning to work on a bomb began that work. Not only England and Germany and the United States, but also France, Japan, and the Soviet Union. The greatest threat came from Germany. We had information in those days of German activity in the field of nuclear fission. We were aware of what it might mean if they beat us to the draw in the development of atomic bombs. I had relatives there and was later to help in extricating them and bringing them to this country. Nine months after the discovery of nuclear fission, World War II began. When America joined the war two years later, the military feared that Germany were well ahead in developing a nuclear weapon. America urgently needed to catch up. In October 1942, on a train to New York City, Oppenheimer was sharing a cabin with a 46-year-old career army officer, General Leslie Groves. Groves had been given the command of the US efforts to build a nuclear bomb, codename the Manhattan Project. He thought he may have found the scientist to lead the secret lab where the bomb would be designed and built. Groves's way of operating to be blunt and brutal. He knew, as they said during the First World War, how to get the spam to the front lines. He knew how to get the job done. After hours of discussion, Groves had made his decision. He concluded that Oppenheimer had the ambition and skills to face one of the most complicated scientific challenges ever undertaken. He's a genius, Groves remarked. He can talk to you about anything you bring up. Well, not exactly. He doesn't know anything about sports. Groves went way out on the limb in choosing Oppenheimer. No one would have, would have supposed that this esoteric person with a, an interest in French poetry and Hindu mysticism would be a practical person to lead a laboratory. He had never directed anything, really, to, to speak of. He hadn't even been a department chairman. Most of his friends think that Oppenheimer could not run a hamburger stand. For different reasons, Oppenheimer's appointment was soon in doubt. The army refused to authorize his security clearance. The United States and the Soviet Union may have been allies, but anyone with communist associations was still considered a possible spy. The security people are appalled. Oppenheimer is the last person they would want as director, and he's the next to last person they'd even want involved in the project at all as a, uh, as a janitor. Groves is very conservative. He hates communists. But Groves does not allow Oppenheimer's left-wing activities during the 1930s to trump his belief that Oppenheimer will be just the right person. In early 1943, I received a letter appointing me director of the laboratory. Almost everyone knew this was a great undertaking. It might determine the outcome of the war. It was an unparalleled opportunity to bring to bear the knowledge and art of science for the benefit of the country. This job, if it were achieved, would be part of history. Oppenheimer knew exactly where he wanted to make his part of history. A remote desert in New Mexico where he had spent many holidays, Los Alamos. Before departing for Los Alamos to start his top secret work, Oppenheimer had dinner with one of his old left-wing friends. In his time at Berkeley, Oppenheimer had become friends with Harkon Chevalier, a professor of French. Chevalier was a dedicated and active member of the Communist Party. Oppenheimer had known Chevalier for years. He was, Chevalier was one of his closest friends. He knew Chevalier was a communist. It didn't really worry him. He judged that Chevalier wouldn't do anything that would compromise Robert Oppenheimer. But at dinner, Chevalier put that judgment in doubt. He talked to Oppenheimer about his work before making a fateful suggestion. Chevalier was in touch with a British engineer called George Elterton and told Oppenheimer that Elterton wanted inside information about Oppenheimer's work to pass on to the Soviet Union. He offered to put them in touch. 
Oppenheimer dismissed the idea out of hand. That would be treason, he said. He thought little of the encounter, probably not taking the proposition seriously. In time, though, the short conversation would come back to haunt him. Doctor, do you think that social contacts between a person employed in secret war work and communists or communist adherents is dangerous? Certainly not necessarily so. They could conceivably be. My awareness of the danger would be greater today. Doctor, in your opinion, is association with the communist movement compatible with a job on a secret war project? I was associated with the communist movement and I did not regard it as inappropriate to take the job at Los Alamos. Doctor, let me ask you a blunt question. Don't you know, and didn't you know certainly by 1943, that the Communist Party was an instrument or a vehicle of espionage in this country? I was not clear about it. I am asking you now, if fear of espionage wasn't one of the reasons why you felt that association with the Communist Party was inconsistent with work on a secret war project? Yes. Your answer is that it was? Yes. You would have felt then, I assume, that a rather continued or constant association between a person employed on the atomic bomb project and communists or communist adherents was dangerous. Potentially dangerous. Uh, conceivably dangerous. Look, I have had a lot of secrets in my head a long time. It does not matter who I associate with, I don't talk about those secrets. Oppenheimer arrived in Los Alamos in April 1943. He was about to embark on a task for which many questioned his suitability. Still only 38 years old, the challenges he faced were immense. A whole town was being constructed, and Oppenheimer was trying to organize the science. But in addition, they were constructing roads, laboratory buildings, and homes. We had no sidewalks anywhere, and in one season of the year, walked around in mud up to our ankles. They were trying to build a first-class physics laboratory out in the middle of a howling wilderness. It was a hell of a place to try to move a linear accelerator up the narrow switchback mountain roads to install it at the top. To add to the difficulties, Los Alamos had to be shrouded in complete secrecy. Army intelligence officers watched everything and everybody, especially those with questionable pasts. Oppenheimer's phone was tapped, his mail was opened, and his office wired. His driver and bodyguard was an undercover agent. He was viewed as a particular security risk, and though he knew everything that went on in his lab, he still didn't have security clearance. Oppenheimer goes about doing the job as best he can do it, but the security people are like flies on a hot summer day. They're constantly buzzing around him. They're constantly annoying him. He does his best to shoo them you know, away. But there's one instance where he makes a terrible, terrible mistake. I had visited Gene Tadlock in the spring of 1943. Uh, I almost had to. She was not much of a communist, but she was certainly a member of the party. There was nothing dangerous about that. There was nothing potentially dangerous about that. Of course, the security teams already knew of Oppenheimer's visit to his radical ex-girlfriend. His watchers had waited while he spent the night with Gene Tatlock. They reported the news to the FBI. Why did you have to see her? She had indicated a great desire to see me before we left for Los Alamos. At that time, I couldn't go. For one thing, I wasn't supposed to say where we were going or anything. I felt that she had to see me. She was undergoing psychiatric treatment. She was extremely unhappy. Did you find out why she had to see you? Because she was still in love with me. When did you see her after that? She took me to the airport and I never saw her again. 
Jean Tentlock was a wounded, lonely woman who was at wit's end, and she wanted this man whom she loved to come to her, and he did. From the point of view of the gumshoes who sat outside Jean Tentlock's apartment all night in their car, writing down who came and who went and at what hour, and when the lights were on, when the lights were off, there may have been a security problem. But for him, human need, human compassion, caring for someone you love, trumped the security system. The FBI were concerned that Tatlock might be passing nuclear secrets to the Russians. But persistent surveillance revealed nothing. Six months after Robert's visit, Jean Tatlock killed herself. You have said that you knew she had been a communist. Yes, I knew that in the uh, fall of 1937. Was there any reason for you to believe that she wasn't still a communist in 1943? No. Pardon? There wasn't. I do not know what she was doing in, in 1943. You have no reason to believe she wasn't a communist, do you? No. You spent the night with her, didn't you? Yes. That is when you were working on a secret war project? Yes. You have told us this morning that you thought that at times social contacts with communists on the part of one working on a secret war project was dangerous. Could conceivably be. You didn't think spending a night with a dedicated communist? I don't believe she was a dedicated communist. You don't? No. Five weeks after his visit to Tatlock, Oppenheimer finally received his security clearance. But the air of suspicion that surrounded him didn't dissipate. In August of 1943, perhaps concerned about how he was viewed or simply wanting to help, Oppenheimer decided to tell security of his discussion with Chevalier. He contacted Colonel Boris Pash, a senior counterintelligence officer. He was facing a delicate balancing act, trying to provide useful information to Pash without incriminating one of his oldest friends or casting more doubt on his own loyalty. General Groves has uh, more or less, I feel, placed a certain responsibility in me. I don't mean to take up too much of your time. That's perfectly all right, well, whatever time you choose. Um, I have no first-hand knowledge, uh, but a man attached to the Soviet Council has indicated uh, indirectly through an intermediary uh, that he was in a position to transmit information. I think it might not hurt to uh, be on the lookout for it. Uh, if you wanted to watch him, um, I think it would be the appropriate thing to do. His name is Eltonton. In giving Army Intelligence George Eltonton's name, Oppenheimer hoped he could pass on the critical information without revealing anything more. In an effort to play down his involvement in the affair, he went on to invent other scientists who had been approached by the mysterious intermediary he'd substituted for Chevalier. He had no idea that the conversation was being recorded with a bug hidden in the telephone. Uh, there were approaches to other people uh, who were troubled by them, and sometimes they came and discussed them with me. Uh, that's as far as I can go on that. Mm. These people, were they contacted directly by Elton? Uh, no. Oh, through a, another party? Yes. Well, now, uh, could we know through whom that contact was made? I think it would be a mistake. Oppenheimer makes up this complicated story so that the security people are looking all over the place uh, and they won't finger Robert and they won't finger Chevalier. He evidently hadn't learned to think the way security people think. Every time he said something else, he just made it worse. Pash ended up, of course, believing Oppenheimer was a communist spy. But I think in mentioning Eltonton's name, I essentially said that he may be acting in a way which is dangerous to the country and which should be watched. I'm not going to mention anyone else's name in the same breath. I, I just can't do that. Mm. 
As with his night visit to Jean Tatlock, Oppenheimer didn't take the incident seriously. There was too much else occupying his mind. Los Alamos had grown into a busy town with thousands of occupants. The magnitude of their task was still becoming apparent. Oppenheimer seemed to thrive on the pressure. In spite of all the doubts about him, he was proving he was up to the job. He showed it an ability to motivate and inspire that I think surprised everyone. Everyone loved him because he was everywhere. He understood all of these absurdly difficult and intractable problems, and he often had witty things to say about them. <laughs> he had a certain charisma, a certain charm, a certain flair. He had a Robin's Egg Glue convertible Cadillac, you know, and if you're a young kid, and here's the boss, and he's driving around with his pork pie hat and his tweed jacket and cigarette always, you know, like in the movies, you know, you're impressed. Oppenheimer inspired everyone. He expressed the intellectual essence of what we were doing, the deepest sense of what it was. I don't know, in retrospect, who could have done it better? Who could have pulled that gang, 80% of which were prima donnas of their own, could have pulled that gang together and, and made them work as a, as a unit? The period at Los Alamos was the only time in his life when he wasn't plagued by existential doubt, when all the parts came together and worked together. It was the first chance he'd ever had to serve the country and forget himself. But it was far from plain sailing. One of Oppenheimer's biggest problems was a key member of his team, the Hungarian refugee, Edward Teller. Teller was always an ebullient scientist, very bright, quite impatient. When I showed up at Los Alamos, uh, I saw this name chalked next to the door, E. Teller, but there was no one in the office. I learned that he was rather unhappy that he had not been chosen as leader of the theory division and had gone off in a puff. His passion from the very first was to create what he called the super, the super bomb. The super was a hydrogen bomb, a weapon that dwarfed the destructive power of the atom bomb. Since it needed an atomic bomb to set it off, Oppenheimer had little interest in Teller's ambitions. Oppenheimer said, no, no, we've got enough on our hands. We're not going to, we're not going to, we got to make the, we got to make the atomic bomb. That's what we're going to do. That's our job. And that's what we're going to focus on. When Teller threatened to leave the project, Oppenheimer relented. He let Teller work independently to pursue his plan. It was a compromise, but there would always be bad blood between them. By the summer of 1944, life at Los Alamos was wearing Oppenheimer down. He was losing weight, and despite a bad cough, continued to chain smoke. His wife Kitty didn't help. She had refused to engage with life in the camp and found herself floundering. After the birth of their second child, she began to drink heavily, seemingly at the verge of a total collapse. But Oppenheimer worked on relentlessly. For me, it was a time so filled with work, with the need for decision and action and consultation, uh, there was room for little else. They had to invent all these new technologies in these very short months from the summer of 44 to the summer of 45. Oppenheimer nearly broke down. He was really depressed. He thought he'd blown it. He thought they had found themselves at a dead end. It was devilishly difficult, grappling with problems which were on the edge of absurdity. Just imagine trying to find out what's going on within an explosion, all of which is over in less than a thousandth of a second. He seriously considered leaving the project, and one of his friends finally took him aside and said, Robert, you can't leave. You're the only person who can make this happen. You have to stay. I don't care what you think. And he did stay. The consensus of all our opinions and every directive I had stressed the extreme urgency of the work. Time and time again, we had in the technical work almost paralyzing crises. 
Time and again, the laboratory drew itself together, and we faced the new problems and got on with the work. We worked by night and by day. As the team battled to reach their goal, the war was reaching a bloody climax. In May 1945, the Germans surrendered. The race for the bomb seemed to be over. When Germany surrenders, the bomb is several months away from being built, and the question is, should we continue? Is it the right thing to do? Is it ethical? Well, you've never heard any suggestion from Oppenheimer that uh, <laughs> there was any course other than continuing. There was a kind of momentum involved in our efforts in this direction. It was an enormous project. We were all deeply involved in finding out whether the darn thing would work. When you see something that is technically sweet, you go ahead and do it. And you argue about what to do about it only after you've had your technical success. But Oppenheimer wasn't only looking for technical success. He had begun to hope that creating an atomic bomb could sufficiently scare people that it might actually prevent another war. This might help to convince everybody, he wrote, that the next war would be fatal. But merely having the bomb would not get that message across. For this purpose, he argued, actual combat use might even be the best thing. Actual combat use wouldn't take long to come about. On May 31st, Oppenheimer joined a top secret meeting with the army and government. The meeting agreed on a target that was a vital war plant employing a large number of workers and closely surrounded by workers' homes. Oppenheimer made no objection. He seemed more worried about whether the bomb would work. His answer came six weeks later in New Mexico's Almogordo Desert, a place the Spanish had called the Journey of Death. On July 15th, Oppenheimer made his final inspection of the bomb. It would be tested the next day. He was tired and drawn, and noticeably on edge. There was great tension about the test, great uncertainty whether it would work or produce a, a pathetic fizzle. This had never been done before, and it was a, no one had a, a clear picture at all of what, what to expect. On the evening before the test, Someone recalled, the frogs had gathered in a little pond by the camp and copulated and squawked all night long. Oppenheimer sat reading Baudelaire, chain-smoking nervously. At ten past five in the morning, the countdown began. As loudspeakers announced every passing minute, Oppenheimer wandered in and out of the control bunker, often glancing up at the sky. As the two-minute warning was sounded, he was heard to say, Lord, these affairs are hard on the heart. The clock kept ticking on. We were given a piece of welder's glass to hold in front of our eyes so that we could look at it without being blinded. It was pitch dark outside just before dawn. There was a lot of tension. Oppenheimer lay on his stomach, his face withdrawn. He grew tenser as the last seconds ticked off, an army general recalled. He scarcely breathed. For the last few seconds, he stared directly ahead. It was a brilliant flash like daylight outside, suddenly from pitch dark to daylight over a huge area. There was this rapidly expanding glowing sphere with swirling dark clouds in it and 
Finally, as it dimmed, you could see on the outside a faint blue glow. It was simply fantastic. It worked, was all Oppenheimer could say. It worked. We were just awestruck. There it was. It had happened. And the test was evidently a success, but we had no idea when the next thing would happen. Nobody had said to us that the bomb had already been shipped out. There was total silence. Fear and tension, now we're into something. Now, who knows what's going to ensue? We heard not a single word until the 6th of August. On the 6th of August, 1945, according to plan, the US exploded an atomic bomb over Hiroshima, a city with a population of 350,000. Despite his close involvement in the planning, he had given the Air Force precise instructions for the detonation. Oppenheimer had been darkly mourning. Those poor little people, he said. Those poor little people. Oppenheimer felt deeply ambivalent. The technical success was exhilarating, but he was traumatized by the human cost. I think Oppenheimer saw the question in all its complexity. It wasn't so simple as, was he guilty about building such a weapon? He understood that the bomb was going to change history. They knew what they were making. They knew it was going to kill a lot of people. They didn't like that aspect of it. But there you were. Three days later, a second bomb obliterated Nagasaki. By this stage, Oppenheimer was morose, tortured by doubts. His depression was returning. This undertaking, he wrote to a friend, has not been without its misgivings. They are heavy on us today, when the future, which has so many elements of high promise, is yet only a stone's throw from despair. Some of you will have seen photographs of the Nagasaki strike, he told the American Philosophical Society three months after the blast, seeing the great steel girders of factories twisted and wrecked. Atomic weapons are weapons of aggression, of surprise, and of terror. If they are ever used again, it may well be by the thousands, or perhaps by the tens of thousands. He was a great supporter of using the bomb, but he understood all along that he was on the cusp of a new terror. Even at the moment when the scientists believed that there was no other choice. They knew that most of the people killed were civilians. They knew that the targets for these bombs were the centers of cities. It's a very heavy burden that he carries into the post-war period after Hiroshima and Nagasaki are destroyed. I have been asked whether in the years to come it will be possible to kill 40 million American people in the 20 largest American towns by the use of atomic bombs in a single night. I'm afraid that the answer to that question is yes. At this stage, America had the secret of the atomic bomb to itself. President Harry Truman was convinced that national security relied on keeping things that way. Oppenheimer and most of his colleagues loudly disagreed. I have been asked whether there is hope for the nation's security. 
in keeping secret some of the knowledge in, which has gone into the making of the bombs. I am afraid there is no such hope. President Truman really did seem to feel that if you just kept the lid on enough, we'd always have the secret and no one else would ever get it. There wasn't any secret. The secret was it worked. Increasingly concerned, Oppenheimer requested a meeting with the president to try and bring him round. When the president tried to assure him that the Soviets would never get the bomb, Oppenheimer misjudged his response. Mr. President, he said, I feel I have blood on my hands. Truman was furious at Oppenheimer's arrogance. Blood on his hands, he exclaimed, damn it, he hasn't half as much blood on his hands as I have. It's not surprising Truman just about threw him out of his office. It was the president's decision. It wasn't Oppenheimer's decision. Truman later told aides, I don't want to see that son of a bitch in this office again. But Oppenheimer's fame was growing. His name a household word. He became the father of the A-bomb. His prominence was such that he became the government's top advisor on atomic weapons. Despite his run-in with Truman, he was developing ambitions beyond physics. He was instantly famous. Nuclear weapons, nuclear energy, were such a big and new thing, and such a surprise to nearly everyone, that it was very widespread to ask your local physicists, what does this all mean, and what should we do? Now, Oppenheimer was right at the top of it. So it was the president, or the Congress, or the senators, or the UN, you know, who asked him and for whom he gave his advice. He realized that he might turn this fame and power into statesmanship that he might become the sort of philosopher-scientist, a philosopher-statesman who could bring the rest of the message to government about how you'd go about eliminating nuclear weapons in the world. Oppenheimer was naive enough. He really thought that if he got inside, he could change things. Immediately after the war, I was deeply involved in the effort to devise effective means for the international control of atomic weapons. Enjoying his newfound role as statesman, in 1946, Oppenheimer developed an ambitious proposal. His idea was to create an international agency which controlled the entire nuclear industry, everything from power plants to weapons. It was visionary, but naive. It involved giving up nuclear weapons and internationalizing the entire nuclear enterprise. And Oppenheimer writes, we know that people will say, this is impossible, you can't do this. Our answer is, we must. But Oppenheimer's ambition for an international agreement was unrealistic. The Soviet army already occupied much of Eastern Europe, and the US administration had begun to worry about them advancing west. Antagonism was growing, and Joseph Stalin had concerns of his own. The Soviet Union was not about to let the United States have a monopoly on these weapons. They didn't trust us, with reason. We had, after all, built a weapon in secret, telling our allies Great Britain, but not telling our allies the Soviet Union, and actually used the thing on, the, on an enemy population. Stalin had every reason to believe that we would use it on him. Opposed from all sides, Oppenheimer's first real foray out of physics and into politics went nowhere. So it was a brilliant and radical and evidently premature idea. The US nuclear program was continuing apace. In July 1946, they exploded a 21,000 ton bomb on Bikini Atoll in the Pacific Ocean. Two months previously, Oppenheimer had again voiced concerns about the project to Harry Truman. Truman roundly ignored the man he called that crybaby scientist. But though Oppenheimer was growing increasingly disillusioned with US nuclear policy, he was even more concerned about the Soviets. He saw how intransigent the Russians were going to be. 
And he went into another mode in his thinking about what should be done about the bomb. A few months later, the US government created the Atomic Energy Commission. Oppenheimer was given a senior role. Trying to formulate a new strategy, he reached what he called a melancholy conclusion. As the prospects of success receded, and as the evidence of Soviet hostility and growing military power accumulated, we were more and more to devote ourselves to finding ways of adapting our atomic potential to offset the Soviet threat. We concluded that the principal job of the Commission was to provide atomic weapons, and good atomic weapons, and many atomic weapons. As he tried to forge himself as a scientific statesman, Oppenheimer seemed to be leaving physics behind. After the war, he had left teaching and become director of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Here, he mingled with some of the greatest scientists in history. But Oppenheimer's research increasingly got left behind. His productivity in Göttingen was long forgotten. His scientific papers few and far between. And that was a great grief to him. He had had dreams of getting back into science and doing something great while he was here. His wife Kitty begged me if, if I couldn't actually work with Robert and actually do some science with him. And I never could. Some, you know, it was, uh, he, he never got down to the nitty gritty. He was older. What, he was 40? He was past the age when people do their best scientific work. Nonetheless, his public persona had never shone brighter. He was portrayed as a model American, a genius scientist with a happy marriage and two small children. Some in the US administration, however, had growing doubts about J. Robert Oppenheimer. Communists have been, still are, and always will be a menace to freedom, to democratic ideals, to the worship of God, and to America's way of life. J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, was determined to root out the communists he believed were hidden in every walk of life. Despite Oppenheimer's immense reputation and service to his country, his communist associations made him an object of real suspicion. There were periods in which there was a let-up, but the FBI started to follow and surveil Oppenheimer in about 1940, 1941, and never stopped. Never stopped. In 1948, the House Committee on Un-American Activities had led to the trial of Alger Hiss, a State Department official, on charges related to communism. In 1949, Oppenheimer was subpoenaed to appear. He tried to charm the committee, but under intense questioning, he buckled. He confirmed the names of Communist Party members, some of whom had been his students. It looked as though he was just trying to save his own skin by incriminating the students. To me, it was, it was horrible. He must have sensed that the flames could get to him sometime, and it wasn't clear to him what he should do. Oppenheimer survived the ordeal, but an appearance before a different committee a few days later would eventually prove more disastrous. Louis Strauss was president of the Institute for Advanced Study, Oppenheimer's boss. He was also a member of the Atomic Energy Commission. A proud and fiercely anti-communist self-made millionaire, he did not like to be crossed. If you disagree with Lewis about anything, a colleague recalled, he assumes you're a fool. But if you go on disagreeing with him, he concludes you must be a traitor. At his second appearance before Congress, Oppenheimer was arguing in favor of exporting nuclear isotopes to Europe. My opinion is that if the determination were made that isotopes should not be shipped abroad, the Congress would be making a profound mistake. Oppenheimer knew that Strauss violently disagreed. He was convinced they would fall into Russian hands. In a reckless and costly display of arrogance, Oppenheimer openly mocked Strauss's position. 
He told the committee that the isotopes were no more dangerous than a shovel or a bottle of beer. And everybody laughed, and the journalist said he looked over at Louis Strauss, who had turned beet red. He had never seen so much hate and anger on anyone's face as he saw on Strauss's face at that moment. Strauss was very sensitive to criticism. <laughs> if he didn't like people, he dealt with them. And he had a long memory. He could deal with them a long time afterward, um, if he wanted to. Strauss, along with the rest of his country, would be rocked two months later, when, as Oppenheimer had foreseen, the Soviet Union tested its first atomic bomb. There was near hysteria in Washington. People were running around screaming, the sky is falling in. Now, why would they do that? If you've got all of your eggs in the basket that it's a secret, and then the secret is lost, then of course you think you've lost everything. On the day the test made the headlines, Oppenheimer received a call from an agitated Edward Teller. What should I do now? Teller asked. Keep your shirt on, Oppenheimer replied. From Teller's point of view, there was a balance of forces between us and the Soviet Union in Europe. They had four million men on the ground in Eastern Europe, and we had the bomb. Now, suddenly, they had four million men on the ground in Europe, we had the bomb, and they had the bomb. So the balance of forces was upset. He hated the Soviet Union. He grew up in Hungary, and communism was a four-letter word. So he thought the only way you could deal with the Soviet Union was have more bombs than they did, that they would be influenced by force and by nothing else. Teller was convinced that the answer to the Soviet threat lay in the work he had started at Los Alamos, building the super, a hydrogen bomb. Any work on the H-bomb, though, would have to be approved by Oppenheimer's committee. A good many people came to me or called me or wrote me letters about the super program. It was not clear to me what the right thing to do was. Was it crash development? the most rapid possible development and construction of a super? The divisive debate about the H-bomb was one fraught with pitfalls for the unsuspecting Oppenheimer. Ever since the war had ended, Teller had been trying to convince any high official who would listen that the super would keep Americans safe. He thought that if we didn't develop it, the Russians surely would, and we would be at their mercy. He thought that it would be crazy not to develop it and that those who opposed it might possibly be unpatriotic. The committee concluded that it shouldn't be built because uh, this was a weapon of genocide that had absolutely no uh, military necessity and that our stockpile of atomic bombs was a sufficient deterrent. Oppenheimer and his committee of some of America's most eminent nuclear scientists had made their judgment. But President Truman, no fan of Oppenheimer, feared the Russians might get there first. He overruled the committee. Two years later, Teller's dream would come true when the world's first hydrogen bomb vaporized an island in the Pacific Ocean. It became a great big lagoon. It just went away. And the whole water around it was milky white. It was scary. The heat from this thing was really very frightening. It started getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. This is almost 30 miles away. It meant that a new era of warfare was upon us. We now had in our possession a weapon of genocide, not just warfare. The modern arms race started with the invention of the hydrogen bomb, and after which it was escalation all the way. If the development by the enemy, as well as by us, of thermonuclear weapons could have been averted, 
I think we would be in a somewhat safer world today than we are. God knows not entirely safe because atomic bombs are not jolly either. After Truman's ruling, Oppenheimer had done nothing further to impede work on the H-bomb program. Having considered leaving government altogether, he decided to stay loyal. But his lack of enthusiasm for the project had not gone unnoticed and was open to misinterpretation. Did you, subsequent to the President's decision of January 1950, ever express any opposition to the production of the hydrogen bomb on moral grounds? I would think I could very well have said this is a dreadful weapon or something like that. Why do you think that you could very well have said that? Because I have always thought it was a dreadful weapon. Even if from a technical point of view it was a sweet and lovely and beautiful job, I have still thought it was a dreadful weapon. And have said so? I would assume I have said so, yes. You mean you had a moral revulsion against the production of such a dreadful weapon? This is too strong. Beg pardon? That is too strong. Which is too strong, the weapon or my expression? Your expression. I had grave concern and anxiety. You had moral qualms about it, is that accurate? Let us leave the word moral out of it. You had qualms about it. How could one not have qualms about it? I know no one who doesn't have qualms about it. Oppenheimer wasn't opposed to building nuclear weapons. He was just opposed to building huge nuclear weapons that, wouldn't, that were bigger than the targets. In 1950, two years before the H-bomb was ready for testing, the Korean War began. America was now battling Chinese and Korean communists, and tensions with Russia were still rising. In 1951, Oppenheimer was shown how his brainchild, the atomic bomb, dominated the Air Force's strategic war plan. The plan was that we would bomb our way across Eastern Europe with nuclear weapons. We would then destroy the Soviet Union, and then, as a kind of an extra, we'd go on and destroy China, because after all, it was a communist country. The American government was planning in its nuclear weapons response to any Soviet attack to kill 200 and something million people within a week or two. Uh, I mean, Oppenheimer just felt that this was madness, sheer madness. Oppenheimer the statesman felt compelled to speak out for moderation. He argued against nuclear-powered aircraft and submarines and advocated open discussion of the arms race. His enemies were listening. And there's grave danger for us that these decisions are taken on the basis of facts held secret. If we are guided by fear alone, we'll fail in this time of crisis. Though he had the ear of the public, Oppenheimer's doubters were becoming ever more powerful. When Eisenhower succeeded Truman in the Oval Office, Louis Strauss became chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. His new position gave him even more influence over Oppenheimer's future. Within five days of his appointment, Strauss had ordered the removal of all classified documents from Oppenheimer's office. Strauss would deliberately destroy the name and reputation and government position of Robert Oppenheimer. And when he destroyed something, he destroyed it thoroughly. Strauss began to orchestrate a press campaign that suggested Oppenheimer was undermining the nation's atomic weapons program. The stories hinted that it was Teller, not Oppenheimer, who was the true scientific patriot. Teller, who had long wanted to oust Oppenheimer from public life, readily joined the crusade. In 1951, he told the FBI that a lot of people believe Oppenheimer opposed the development of the hydrogen bomb on direct orders from Moscow. Teller sincerely believed that we were in a dangerous arms race with the Russians and that Oppenheimer was standing in the way of protecting the country against this dreaded foe. I think he may well have sincerely believed that. And I'm sure for Teller, 
It was also a very personal jealousy. Oppenheimer likes his bomb, but he doesn't like my bomb. I know that sounds absurd, and yet I have no doubt that it was part of the equation. So get rid of him and then tell her like cream would rise to the top of the bottle. They needed to get Oppenheimer out of the way so that Strauss and Teller could realign the physics community around the dream of building new and better bombs. Teller's claims chimed with recent reports that on Oppenheimer's watch, Soviet agents had penetrated Los Alamos and obtained nuclear secrets. Their fears seemed confirmed when the Russians tested their own H-bomb in 1953. Two years before, reports that Soviet agents had penetrated Los Alamos and passed atomic secrets to the Russians had stunned them. Convinced America was vulnerable, many started searching for people to blame. Are you a member of the communist conspiracy as of this moment? People were really convinced that tomorrow, Soviets were going to take over America. And they were convinced that it would be because of internal subversion. Not because of external activity, but because we had spies, and they were destroying the American way. A former colleague in the atomic energy community was convinced Oppenheimer was one of them. William Borden had harbored his doubts for years. He decided to share his suspicions with Strauss. Borden is the natural ally of Louis Strauss. And Strauss allows Borden to take Oppenheimer's security file home. And Borden studies it for months and writes this letter to J. Edgar Hoover. Borden leveled a number of charges at Oppenheimer. His conclusion was damning. More probably than not, Borden wrote, J. Robert Oppenheimer is an agent of the Soviet Union. Hoover forwarded the letter to the White House. The president called in Louis Strauss to help him make a decision. Strauss convinces Eisenhower that if this letter was sat on by the administration, it would cost Eisenhower politically, and Eisenhower declares that a wall should be put between Oppenheimer and secrecy. On December 21st, 1953, Strauss told Oppenheimer his security clearance had been suspended. Oppenheimer, who had been totally unaware of the scale of the campaign against him, was stunned. Oppenheimer realized that he was going to pay. I think he had the tragic sense. He understood the drama that he had to play out, even though he later called it a farce. It was reported that in 1940, you were listed as a sponsor of the Friends of the Chinese People, an organization characterized by the House Committee on Un-American Activities as a communist front organization. It was reported that you strongly opposed the hydrogen bomb on moral grounds and by claiming that it was not feasible and not politically desirable. And even after it was determined to proceed, you continued to oppose the project. Fighting for his reputation, Oppenheimer had insisted on the hearings. He was still convinced he could clear his name. Oppenheimer couldn't see tucking tail and walking away. What would that say about the charges against him? On the other hand, it's too bad he didn't understand what sort of forces he was up against. The evidence against Oppenheimer was all circumstantial. But the prosecutor, Roger Robb, was a formidable lawyer. He planned to wear his witness down, force him into contradictions and embarrass him. Your brother Frank told you in 1936, or probably 1937, that he and his wife Jackie had joined the Communist Party. Did he ask your advice about it? Oh, Lord, no. He hadn't taken the step. 
I had confidence in his decency and straightforwardness and in his loyalty to me. Tell us the test that you apply to acquire the confidence that you have spoken of. Uh, in the case of a brother, one doesn't make tests. At least I didn't. Well... I knew my brother. When did you decide that your brother was no longer a member of the party and no longer dangerous? I never regarded my brother as dangerous. Even with an attorney as experienced as Rob, Straws wasn't taking any chances. The hearing became a trial and Straws was making the rules. He selected the judges and refused the defense team any access to evidence or witnesses. They are in a war against communism and therefore the normal rules of justice have to be set aside in order to protect uh, the body politic. Straws was even prepared to break the law. The FBI was secretly bugging and recording Oppenheimer everywhere he went. The defense's every move was known to the prosecutors in advance. It was the worst kind of kangaroo court. They had them ten ways to Sunday. Uh, there were approaches to other people um, who were troubled by them, and sometimes they came and discussed them with me. Uh, that's as far as I can go on that. Unbeknownst to Oppenheimer or his lawyer, Rob had discovered the secret recording of Oppenheimer's conversation with Colonel Pash. He studied the transcript and prepared a trap to catch Oppenheimer in a lie. Did Chevalier tell you or indicate to you in any way that he had talked to anyone but you about this matter? No. You are sure about that? Yes. Did you learn from anybody else or hear that Chevalier had approached anyone but you about this matter? No. You are sure about that? That is right. Doctor, I would like to read from the transcript of your interview with Colonel Pash. There were approaches to other people who were troubled by them and sometimes came and discussed them with me. That's as far as I can go on that. Do you recall saying something like that? I don't recall that conversation very well. I can only rely on the transcript. Doctor, for your information, I might say that we have a record of your voice. Sure. Do you have any doubt that you said that? No. So as to be clear, did you discuss with or disclose to Pash the identity of Chevalier? No. Let us refer to him then, for the time being, as X. All right. Didn't you say that X had approached three people? Probably. Why did you do that, Doctor? Because I was an idiot. <laughs> Is that your only explanation, Doctor? I was reluctant to mention Chevalier. Yes. No doubt somewhat reluctant to mention myself. So you told Pash that there were several people that were contacted. Right. And your testimony now is that was a lie. Right. That wasn't true. That is right. You did, you were sure, tell Colonel Pash there was more than one person involved. This whole thing is a pure fabrication, except for the one named Eltonton. <laughs> Why did you go to such great circumstantial detail about this thing if you knew it was a cock and bull story. I fear this whole thing is a piece of idiocy. The purpose in uh, proving him a liar was to impress the hearing board that he couldn't be trusted and that they should declare him a security risk. It had to be totally humiliating and destroy his confidence in himself. He's being told that he's a liar, untrustworthy, unworthy, and he folded. The story I told Pash is not a true story. There were not three or more people involved. 
I believe I can do no more than say that the story I told is a false story. It is not easy to say that. Now, when you ask as to why I did this, other than that I was an idiot, I'm going to have more trouble being understandable. I found myself, I believe, trying to give a tip to the intelligence people without realizing that when you give a tip, you must tell the whole story. But I am in any case solemnly testifying that there was no conspiracy in what I knew and what I know of this matter. I wish I could explain to you better why I falsified and fabricated. The trial proved to him his worst fears. Oppenheimer had been troubled all his life about who he was. He later said that he was repulsive to himself. The trial said that he had defects of character, that he was not a good human being. And unfortunately, he agreed. Oppenheimer testified for 27 hours. A further parade of witnesses was called on both sides. A letter of support was read from Albert Einstein. He already looked demoralized when Edward Teller took to the stand. I thoroughly disagreed with Dr. Oppenheimer in numerous issues, and his actions, frankly, appeared to me confused and complicated. I feel that I would like to see the vital interests of this country in hands which I understand better and therefore trust more. I would feel personally more secure if public matters would rest in other hands. Sorry. After what you've just said, I don't know what you mean. The hearings lasted almost four weeks. In his closing remarks, Oppenheimer's lawyer warned that America must not devour her own children. We find that Dr. Oppenheimer's continuing conduct and associations have reflected a serious disregard for the requirements of the security system. We have found a susceptibility to influence which could have serious implications for the security interests of the country. We find his conduct in the hydrogen bomb program sufficiently disturbing. We have regretfully concluded that Dr. Oppenheimer has been less than candid in several instances in his testimony. By a vote of two to one, the board concluded that though Oppenheimer was a loyal citizen, his security clearance should be revoked. Oppenheimer was devastated. He told a friend, I have so little sense of self remaining. In a futile gesture, he appealed to the Atomic Energy Commission, chaired by Straws. It found against him by four to one. I took a train ride with him to New York. And for some reason, he started talking about my case. My case. And he said to me that at the time, he thought it was happening to somebody else. He wasn't accused in the course of the hearing of having ever betrayed a secret. It was about getting Oppenheimer out of the security councils of the U.S. government. The 
the Oppenheimer hearing was a political battle between the Strauss view, uh, we need more and more and more nuclear weapons, and the Oppenheimer view that nuclear weapons are a part of our defense, but we have to you know, use them sensibly and we can't rely on them totally. That hearing had a profound effect on the nuclear arms race. It essentially opened the floodgates. It removed the legitimacy of criticism against more and more nuclear weapons. We built so many more than we ever needed, and the Soviets followed suit. Soon after the conclusion of the hearing, Oppenheimer turned 50. His aspirations to statesmanship were over. His influence with the government, dead. He would live for 13 more years, but he was never the same man. He had been a strong, forceful leader before that, and he was a beaten man afterwards. He gave lectures on science and its interaction with humanity. He continued to direct the Institute for Advanced Study. He became what Yeats calls a smiling public man. I saw a lot of him at that time, and I saw the impact that this tragedy had on him. I can't recall ever seeing him happy, you know, just relaxed and having fun. I don't have the feeling that he ever felt good about himself, that if he was ever in any sense, at peace with himself. In 1963, President Lyndon Johnson awarded Oppenheimer the Fermi Award, one of the nation's highest scientific honors. Many saw it as an oblique apology for everything he'd been through. Ironically, it was sponsored by the Atomic Energy Commission. With countless other men and women, we are engaged in this great enterprise of our time, testing whether men can live without war as the great arbiter of history. I think it just possible, Mr. President, that it has taken some charity and some courage for you to make this award today. Edward Teller was there that day, come to offer his congratulations. When he extended his hand, once again, Oppenheimer shook it. After the ceremony, Louis Straws wrote an angry letter to Life magazine, complaining that honoring Oppenheimer dealt a severe blow to the security system which protects our country. Mm -hmm. 